couple of years ago, I pulled it. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning. This is the fifth day of July, 2012. I'm Dr. Jack Hurland, a volunteer and docent at the Palm Springs Air Museum in Southern California. Part of our mission is to record and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in those conflicts. Today I'm on location at the Covenant Village at Westminster, Colorado. And today I have the honor and privilege of interviewing Signalman Second Class Maurice Anderson. Signalman Second Anderson served on the transport carrier Steamer Bay, CVE 87, in the Pacific Theater from 1944 to 1946. He was awarded the American Campaign Medal, the Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal with seven stars, and the Philippine Liberation Campaign Medal, among others. So we're going to be talking about this and several other areas and points of interest. It's a privilege and a pleasure to have you with us today and this morning, Secondman uh, Anderson. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm going to move this out of our way just a little bit, and if you can stand just a moment, and uh, we'll move this down over that way. That'll be fine. You can sit down. Thank you. get you into focus here a little bit. Let's see, I want to get a little bit. And that'll start. <clears throat> All right, second signalman, second class. Anderson, will you please pronounce and spell your full name? Maurice Vincent. Anderson, M-A-U-R-I-C-E-V-I-N-C-E-N-T, A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. And where were you born and when? I was born uh, in a country house in uh, Decatur County, Kansas, South Oberlin, Kansas. And that was May 24th. 1925. So you just had a birthday, well, a month and a half ago. Yes. And how old were you on that day? 87. 87 years old. Excellent. What was the name of your father? Elmer Anderson. What kind of work did he, he was a do? farmer. A farmer? And where did his people come from? Um, they came, they were born in uh, Decatur County in their their parents came from Sweden. Do you know whereabouts in Sweden? No, I do not. I can't think of it right off. So, uh, did they talk much about the old country? No, and I wish uh, I wish they yeah. not asked a lot of questions. Yeah. That. Uh, and your mother's name? Esther May Marie Anderson. And what was her maiden name? Nelson. And did she happen to come from Scandinavia as well? Her parents did, yes. And from Sweden? Yes. Yeah. And, and they, you know very little about their folk, her folks? No. They, they homesteaded uh, uh, close to where I was raised. And what part of, what part of the town is Oberlin? Uh, part of the state, I'm sorry. It's uh, northwest Kansas. It's close to the border of Nebraska. It's south of McCook. What's the big city? Um, the nearest big south town. Well, we used to go to McCook. We thought that was a pretty big city. <laughs> <laughs> and then Denver, we'd go there once in a while, and that was really a treat. That was really a big city. Yes, it was. How many miles from Denver to Oberlin? About 250. Okay. 
<coughs> and what? And you said you were born on a farm or in the city? On a farm. On a farm. Mm, yes. And uh, did you have brothers and sisters? I had one older sister. And her name? Maxine Anderson. Mm -hmm. Is she still living today? No, she's she's gone. Yes. And how old? How many years older was she? She was uh, a little over a year. Older than me. And living on the farm, then did you did you and your how old? What was the difference between your ages? Just a couple of years. Yes, and my younger sister was about three years younger. Oh, I see. And is she living? Yes. And her name? Doreen Anderson. I mean, Doreen. Um, Doreen Anderson, but she's married now. Yes. And where does she live today? She lives in Namaskata, Maine. Oh, my. Do you get to see her very often? Uh, I talked to her on the phone mm -hmm. and haven't seen her now for about... Oh, just about two years. So you were the boy, the only boy on yes. the farm? Yes. Did you have any chores that you had to re do regularly? Yes. I had to, I had to milk one cow. Okay. And, uh, every morning? Every morning and every evening. And uh, I had to carry in the coal and the wood for the wood stove. And anything else? Uh, Did you have chickens? Yes, we we had chickens and uh, I'd gather the eggs and sometimes feed the chickens. And your sisters, did they help out? Not as much as I was like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what kind of <clears throat> games were you able to play or sport to play uh, as, as youngsters uh, around the farm? Well, <coughs> I got football for Christmas and couldn't get anybody to come out and play with me. So I just kick it in the air and run and get it. And uh, I used to tease my sister about not coming out, but she just. <coughs> she wouldn't. She liked to stay inside. Did you play uh, hide and seek or various other things? Uh... Uh, we used to play some games inside, but I don't remember hide and seek. Well, uh, did you go to grammar school? Yes. Where? It was two miles away, and it was called Sweet Home School. Sweet? Sweet Home. How do you spell that? S W E D E. Oh, Sweet Sweet Home. Yes. And that was a local grammar school. Yes. How many and grades with eight? Eight grades. And How many rooms in the school? One. One room. One room and then a cloak room. Okay, so how many kids were there in your class? Uh, there were three of us that went from first grade through high school. Okay, uh, and what were their names? Uh, Dwight Winger and Max Alstrom. Both fellas? Both were guys? Yes, yes. And so did you play around with them at school? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, we used to play. Uh, we always carried knives. We, uh, all three of us got a pair of boots when we were about eight years old, and it had a pocket on the side for the knife in it. I remember those. And uh, we used to just uh, throw it in the ground. Uh, and we'd make a circle in the, in the dust and see who could hit the circle and this <laughs> and that. Did you, uh, did you, were you a good student in grammar school? Not as good as I could have been. And what was the name of your teacher? My first grade teacher was Lauren Alexander. My second grade teacher was Bertie Marcuson. And she was a teacher for two years and then uh, Sarah Woolley was uh, another teacher, and then my last teacher was um, later on my aunt Frances Anderson. Oh, who who was your favorite? May I ask? Uh, Frances Anderson. <laughs> she was going to be my aunt. The aunt. Okay. Were they all young the uh, teachers, young ladies? 
they weren't that I thought of. I thought they were pretty old. <laughs> they were really young. They were probably in their less than forty. Mm -hmm. And did they live all live in the neighborhood? Uh, in the surrounding area? Just when they were teaching. You know, they were from different parts of the county. I see. And uh, so you left grammar school and then went to high school? Yes. And what was the name of the high school? Decatur Community High School. Located? In Oberlin, Kansas. Yeah, right there in town. What yeah. was the population of Oberlin? It was uh, about 2,200 at the time. How did you get to grammar school? Well, we'd walk when the weather was nice, and and then uh, later I got a pony. And I was pretty pleased because I got a pony, but I found out later that, well, we rode it to school, my sister and I, my oldest sister. And what I. was the name of the pony? Jerry. Okay. And uh, in the summertime, I was assigned to herding cattle, herding cattle in the stubble fields and to keep them out of the green corn. And For whom? So For your my dad? dad and, and my uncle, Herbert Anderson. What kind of acreage did uh, your dad have? He had uh, uh, three quarters that he farmed. Three quarters of an acre? Three quarters of a section. A section, oh, good. And he grew corn? Corn, corn and mostly wheat. Mm -hmm. And then we grew uh, cane uh, that we fed to the cow, cattle. Did your dad uh, do much hunting? No, not very much. I was, I, I would go hunting by myself and just, we had a lot of jackrabbits and... Did you have a dog? Yes. What kind of a dog and what was his name? It was just a mutt, <laughs> but uh, he was a good friend. Was he? Yes. Yeah, we... And when you went hunting, when you went hunting, what uh, kind of gun did you use? I borrowed my dad's uh, <coughs> double barrel 16 gauge. So he did have a double barrel 16? Yes, he did. Did he? Sh did you have any birds that you shot? We used to go pheasant hunting later on when we got some pheasants. So, and that was always fun. I bet they loved the wheat fields. Yes, they did. And that made good eating, did it not? Yes, and uh, good coverage for them, so you'd have to kick them up. Right. Well, in uh, high school then, uh, did you play any sports? I went, I was, went out for wrestling. Oh. And uh, I was pretty small. I was only 85 pounds when I was a freshman. And uh, competed with the state champion. And uh, that's about all the further I got was just wrestling with him. Uh, <laughs> What was your favorite subject and, and who was your teacher? Keep talking, I'm going to close the store. What was your favorite teacher? Well, let's see. Uh, Miss McMullen. She taught English. And was that your favorite subject? Not necessarily, but I, I could say it was one of my favorite subjects, yes. Mm -hmm. And what other activities were you involved with in high school? Um, not, uh, well, I was in the band. I played a French horn. And how did you, did you take lessons in school then? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. and, uh, how did you gravitate to the French horn? That, uh, the band instructor needed someone with French horn, <laughs> so I was sort of drafted in a way. Uh -huh. Me and my friend, uh, um, Max Alstrom, so we both took French horn lessons. So you were the French horn section? Yes. <coughs> so there was just, actually just three of us in the French horn section. Huh. 
How big a graduating class did you have? We had 90. Oh, did you? Just about 90, yeah. And what year did you graduate from high school? 1940, 43. 1943? Yes. You graduated. Now, let me ask you this. Do you remember what you were doing or where you were on December 7th, 1941? Yes. My uh, dad and I owned all the engine of the Model T. And uh, we were driving around town and that Model T with some friends. And uh, this is along in the afternoon, and, mm -hmm. and they attacked within the morning, so we didn't hear it till later. Just mm -hmm. someone said that the Japanese had attacked at Pearl Harbor. Were you aware of where Pearl Harbor was located? No. <coughs> I thought it was a lot further yeah. away from the United yeah. States than what it was. Yeah. Did you have any religious background uh, growing up? Yes. What was yeah, that? We in? went to a country church that was three miles from us. And uh, I was uh, uh, converted there in that church and, and uh, went to confirmation. Of, you did? Yes. Was that a Lutheran church? No, it's a Swedish Covenant church. I see. It's a, it's a branch off of the Lutheran right. back in Sweden, the way I understand. Yes. Uh, then, uh, what was your feeling about the Japanese attacking? Now, you were old enough to know something about what was going on in China with the Japanese, and you were probably old enough to know and to understand and realize that Hitler was overrunning Europe. What was the feeling in town in the in the Kansas area well, about the war? It might have been a little fear and hatred that uh, that they were peaceful, mm -hmm. uh, and the same way with the Germans, I couldn't understand why Hitler was trying to gain power. Mm -hmm. Did you have any German friends or Japanese friends? or neighbors in town? No, no, it was pretty much Swedish community. Is that right? Uh, and uh, there was a German community close to Oberlin too, but um, I didn't really know anyone that, with a German background. So upon your graduation, <coughs> by the way, did you own a car at all? During high school? Yes, I had this Model T and then uh, my dad let me rent some ground so I made some money with, with what I sold off of there and I bought a Model A. So I had that Model A. Was, when did you buy the Model T? Uh, it was just kind of my dad's Model T. Oh, I see. Yes. What did your dad have to pay for it? Have any idea? Probably less than five hundred dollars. Uh -huh. And then you you uh, got some land. What did you rent? Bar, uh, rent some land to to do what on? Um, rent it from my dad. Okay. And uh, I planted uh, Milo, mm -hmm. and Milo at the time was coming into use, and and it has about the same value as corn as far as feed value and. Uh, I grew uh, certified seed, so I got a little more money for the mm. for selling it than if it would just been for cattle feed. So you were in charge of that production. Yes. And you bought a Model A. Yes. What did you pay for it? Sixty-five dollars. <laughs> Had it been used? Oh yes, yes, it was well used. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a special girlfriend in high school? Uh, 
Yes, I did. Mary Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not the one I married, but... But she was a girlfriend. She was a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Very, very nice. How nice. What did you do on dates in those days? What did I do what? On dates. Uh, when you went out on a date, what uh, oh, I, what me, activities yes. were uh, were you doing? We just drive around as far as I could remember. Uh, Did you have a radio in the Model A? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did you go to shows or movies? Oh yes, we we go to uh, ten cent movies on Tuesday night. That's, I see. That was a big thing. The theater was that in Oberlin? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, how much was a theater ticket? It's 25 cents for the regular. And you could afford it? Well, I went on Tuesday night, but what I could afford was 10 cents. Ah, good. So. Well, uh, how, what, uh, since you were out of high school uh, in 43, did you have an idea of the military, what you were going to be doing? Well, I knew I didn't want to be in the Army because I, I could imagine all that marching and uh, sleeping in a foxhole and so on. So, so I, I decided for the Navy. If it was a dry bed, unless we were hit or something. Right. Now, uh, and you also had, uh, you were 1A in the military. In the draft, weren't yes. you? Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, were they drafting many farm boys? Yes. Yes, they were. They were taking, trying to fill a quota. Each county had a quota. Mm -hmm. and they would uh, try to fill that quota every every month. And, uh, I got a six month deferment from after I got out of high school, and. Uh, I knew when the date was up, so I volunteered just just before that. And where did you uh, enlist? In Denver. You had to come to Denver? Yes. Uh -huh. And that's where you took the oath? That's where the recruiting office mm -hmm. was. And then, uh, what, then, what date was that? Uh, it had to be in the fall of 43. Did you need your parents' permission? No, because I was 18. 18 years old, okay. Yeah. How did your mother think? She didn't say much, but she she was worried, I know. Of course. And your sisters? They didn't say anything. <laughs> was there a... When you left, was there a big uh, goodbye? Did you come by train? Came by train to uh, Denver, yes. Mm -hmm. My folks uh, came up to see me off. And, mm -hmm. uh, the gas was rationed and we had to be careful. Sure. Uh, the farmers would get extra gas for their tractors and so on, but we were still careful. Yeah. Uh, and then tires were rationed. And, uh, was had recaps, and then they they <laughs> get a bulge in them when they put in a boot. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I do remember that. <clears throat> well, where did you go then? What did the Navy do after you took your oath of office? Uh, they sent me to Farragut, Idaho, by train, and it took us two days. How many of you went? There must have been about uh, 12 or 14 that and came from Denver that, at that time. What did you do in Farragut, Idaho? Went to boot camp. For how long? Uh, for two months. Tell me about what you remember. Well, first thing they shaved our heads and uh, got us all new, new clothes. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, put us in the barracks. It was uh, about a hundred of us in the 
company. Nine twenty or ten ten ninety five was the ten ninety five was your company. Was the company mm -hmm. yes. Um, what kind of uh, training did you go undergo? Uh, in uh, Farragut, it wasn't more than just uh, uh, exercise, and we had a obstacle course, and I was pretty good shape, so. Uh, it didn't bother me much. No, mm -hmm. I just could climb the wall and and so on. Do any marching? Yes. So close, close order drill. Yes, and they had a a big uh, building where we would march when it was real cold. Were you issued any rifles? Uh, just yes, wooden rifles. Wood ones for training. Wooden ones for training, yes. Mm -hmm. And how was the chow? Well, at the time I thought it was good. And what else did you think about uh, about, about those boot days? Did you get leave? I got a leave after two months of boot leave. And where did you go? Uh, I went back to see my folks and then uh, from there went to uh, uh, Bremerton, Washington okay. and we had about two weeks of um, training because they, they came along on this one line and, and this guy asked what, what I, why I wore glasses and, and if I needed them all the time. And I said, no, and he says, come with me. So just like that, he went down the line picking people out for signalmen. For signalmen, I yes. see. So then we uh, trained some with a, a light that they had flashing all the time with a code on it. And Was this at Bremerton? This is at Bremerton, Washington, yeah. So you had learned code? And it just... It was just so easy, I just took to it. Is that right? Yes. And, uh, so, when I got aboard ship, boy, uh, we had to signalize, which were about 18 inches in diameter. And uh, they had a handle and the shutters on them, so you could send, send lights from ship to ship. And we also had a 24-inch light that you could send further hmm. if the ships were further away. So, How about flags? Did they have any flags that they use then? Yes, we used uh, flags for uh, nighttime maneuvers. They'd, every night at sundown they'd, the Admiral ship would uh, uh, run up flag hoist and then we'd run up the exact same flag hoist and uh, then we had a code book that we'd uh, decode it and bring the message up to the captain and to the, uh, the officer to the deck. Can you give me some examples of the messages that you would receive? Um, they were in code. So... Uh, it was not your job to decipher the code? No, not that, no. Okay. So you never knew what they were, what they were talking about. No, I didn't. <laughs> How many signalmen aboard your? Uh, I'm not real sure, but I think there was seventeen or eighteen of us. Now, when did you get to go on board the steamer bay? We went aboard. Uh, uh, it was a brand new ship. Just came out of. Uh, Astoria, Oregon, and that was April 4th, 1944. Okay. And the, the complement of men and officers, do you know about? Um, it seems to me like it was 700 and some men and officers aboard ship. And it was called a carrier transport? Yes. No. Well, why? Because uh, <coughs> it had a flat carrier 
deck on it for uh, sending off and receiving planes. It had a catapult that was 75 foot long and it was run by, by steam and hydraulic. And uh, they'd send off those torpedo bombers with a catapult. And the uh, uh, fighters, we had F4F uh, Wildcats. Mm -hmm. And uh, they'd usually, we'd turn into the wind all the time for takeoff, and there was usually enough wind they could just take off flying up the deck. And uh, I know you, that uh, you left Bremerton, Washington then. Yes. And let's just stop for a moment. I'm going to go down to a couple of pictures that you brought, pictures of when you were young and uh, in uniform, and also a picture as you were. Uh, well, let's let's just sh show everybody here what we've got. And I'm going to go on down and pick some of these out. Now, there's a picture of you, and you can see right on your left there. Um, where the uh, Japanese flags and the airplanes, where was that located? This was uh, on the outside of the bridge, and uh, it was all steel around us. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are uh, indication of what our planes and our ship shot down. And who's the good-looking lad to the to the rough fire right? That has to be myself. And that was taken about when? Uh, probably in 1945, because uh, I noticed I have a, uh, my rating. Your rating then was the signal. I was second one, second class. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to remove those two upper, and would you describe and, and uh, talk about the uh, type of ship that we have right here. Is this the class of the ship, correct? It was a Casablanca cast uh -huh. class ship, mm -hmm. and it was uh, about 500 feet long, and uh, we carried uh, 32 planes all together, 12 torpedo planes, and 20 fighters. Mm -hmm. And this uh, this plane looks like it's it's taken off from the catapult. Mm -hmm. And this is another picture of your ship from. Correct? Yes. Let's see if I can just hone in on that a little bit and get everybody in. So you had uh, a number of naval airmen on board as well. Uh, when we got a uh, uh, squadron aboard, well then, then it was increased to about uh, 1,100 personnel that would be with the pilots and the uh, crewmen and the mechanics and all for the, the planes. And I'm going to show you a picture then of the actual steamer bay under attack by kamikazes. And it's not a good picture, but it's a close one I could locate and find. Uh, let me bring that in a little bit more. And do you happen to remember situations like that when you were on board? Tell us about it. This particular time, uh, I was on the bridge and I was on the right hand side. And uh, I was on the long glass and uh, we were watching for anything because we were, if we were on duty or uh, if we were on the bridge, we'd try to get a hold of a long glass and, and uh, scan the horizon. Was that your battle station then? Yes, uh -huh, it was. 
and I uh, was scanning around with it. Uh, and uh, I noticed there was four specks uh, about two o'clock and I yelled at the captain because he was right there close and I said four specks at two o'clock and he got his binoculars up and, and looked and they called general quarters and about that time the Columbia cruiser started firing and it shot two of them down and the other two went down close to the water and uh, we had two destroyers, one close and one out further and uh, both of them, well one of them made it over both destroyers and was between us and the destroyer and he's coming in low we didn't think we'd shoot into yeah, the destroyer. our destroyer but we had to to, to get him mm -hmm. and uh, shot him down the, before he hit the ship. And then uh, I walked around the other side of the bridge and it was just, oh, everything broke loose. And uh, there was just kamikaze just streaming every which way. And uh, hmm. uh, I saw one of the hit ships got hit. Uh, and then another one got hit, and, hmm. and there was one of them that was coming our way, and and we uh, shot it down between us and the admiral ship, and he wasn't very happy. He, the admiral wasn't. No, he sent us a message and <laughs> let us know what. <laughs> it was a little too close. But, uh, we had to do that to get that plane. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, the day before this, no, even not the day before, but uh, a few hours before this, um, the Omni Bay and the Steamer Bay traded places. For some reason, we don't know, but they, they we traded places, and then two hours later, she was hit with a kamikaze and sunk. The other one. The Omni Bay, yes. Oh, Omni Bay. Hmm. Where were you located then? I was on the bridge. No. Uh, where were you, was the ship located? Was that a task force that you were in off of where? Yes, task force. I can't remember the number of the task force, but it was it was around Iwo Jima and Okinawa. In was area. it one particular battle? Since it was rather late in the war, yeah, it was it was a, a particular battle. Yeah. And do you remember the name? What 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 battle it was? No, I didn't. Naval remember battle. That. Okay. Uh, how many days were you under attack? It was just about uh, I would say a little over an hour. That main attack that we had at that time, and that was. That was it. And that was in what uh, what year? Is that 44 or 45? That would be 44. Uh, 44. In the fall of 44. Yeah. And uh, did any of your planes get off? Um, we lost two planes. And one was a torpedo bomber and one was a fighter. And the uh, one of the planes was lost as he came in to, to land after the battle. Um, he had a hole shot in the wing and uh, come, come crashing in and hit the, the barriers and flipped it over. But the barriers was to keep it out of the planes that were parked in front of it. Hmm. When they come in the land, they had cables across that were pushed up with some support, so sure. to catch the hook that the sure. each plane had 
hanging out uh, and uh, catch a cable and then it would stretch out hydraulically. And <clears throat> How many times were you, uh, was the ship on general quarters that you remember? Any idea? Um, I would say probably six or eight times at least. Mm -hmm. Was the ship ever hit or struck with anything? No. no. Did they stray, stra uh, straff the uh, no. deck in this ship? Nothing. No. And uh, was that, uh, did you, were you housed uh, with the airmen or were they housed in a separate area on board um, ship? They were housed in a separate area. Um, we had the compartment that was about waterline and uh, there was half the, the crew sleeping in the in that compartment and then they had another compartment that was uh, we call it the, the aft department. The, it was further back, or it was the forward compartment. But anyway, and they had their own quarters. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the airmen had quarters that different than that when they came aboard. Uh, of course, the pilots had had their uh, their. Uh, Bunks with the officers on the deck. And how long did each of the, uh, the squadrons stay on board? Did you have one squadron the entire time? No. We had one squadron, I'd say it was on a little over a month, and then we got another squadron. One of the squadron was, uh, um, it had three. Uh, clover leaves. Uh, so, you know, I can't remember the name of the squadron, but that was our symbol. Oh, I see, yes. Well, for, for somebody who hasn't uh, been on board one of these carriers, less <coughs> small transport carriers, uh, <coughs> the, when the squadron left, did they fly the pla their planes off? Yes. Uh, or did the planes stay on the, on the ship? No, they flew them off. They flew them off, and the new squadron came in and flew them on. Yes, they flew on the new squadron. And had they been the new squadron? Had they been on a board ship before? Um, that I do not remember, but I think one of them was was green, and they'd never been on before. And I think the other one had been. In. Did you get to know the people, the airmen at all? Um, I got to know one pilot because every uh, flight operation that he wasn't uh, connected with, he'd be up on the bridge and I uh, was usually standing with him and watching the uh, um, flight operation. Yes. And uh, he was coming in one time and he got a wave off because he was too, too low or something. and. Uh, as he applied the power, his engine calmed out and he just went over the side and crashed in the water and, and he never got out of his planes. So, mm. so he was lost? So he was lost. Yes. Do you remember his name? No, I don't. Mm. I do not remember his name. That's hard to see and take, is it not? Yes, it is. Yeah. When, he seemed pretty close because he yeah. was standing yeah. right there with me. Absolutely. And then I watched him as he crashed. And then one time we had a, a guy aboard ship and he was back on a fantail. Uh, and he was leaning against the chain. We had a chain around the fantail. He was leaning against the chain. He says, I'll give $50 to get off this ship. And about the time the chain broke, oh. and he went over, and they never did find him. Is that one of the ship's company? Yes. Or one of the airmen? One of the ship's company. My goodness. Uh, the destroyers came right, right there, and we oh. threw out 
uh, preservers and everything, but it never did My surface. <clears throat> I know it's rather, uh, those were difficult days, and I suspect you never knew what was coming the next day. No, we didn't. How long were you out on that voyage? Uh, I'd say we were probably six, seven weeks. We were out one time for 60 days without seeing any land and uh, hmm. no mail. I was going to ask, no yeah. mail no for mail. 60 days. And uh, then this one time when, when we traded positions with uh, the Albany Bay, Tokyo Rose had the steamer bay sunk, oh. and that's what uh, my folks heard. Oh my goodness. And uh, um, it was... It Tokyo was Rose being the woman, the Japanese woman. Japanese woman. That, who uh, was good propaganda, at propaganda. Propaganda woman. So, and they announced that the steamer bay had been sunk. Yes. With all hands lost? Well... I don't remember what they said about it. And your folks, how did they hear it? Shortwave radio or was that well, broadcast? It probably broadcast somehow by radio <clears throat> later on. And News bulletins perhaps? Yes. Uh -huh. My goodness, that was treacherous. Yeah, so. <clears throat> did you have a chaplain on board? Yes. Do you remember his name? No, I did not. He was a Catholic chaplain and very nice, I remember that. Uh -huh. Many medical facilities? Yes, we had two doctors and uh, a sick bay. I think there was a couple Corbin. Couple beds in the mm -hmm. sick bay. Were you ever a patient? Yes. <laughs> I had a stomach upset and it was just horrendous. and. Uh, Ended up down there overnight. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the only thing I remember about that. We had two dentists aboard. Is that right? Yes. Do you remember their names? No, I do not. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the facilities is just just mind-boggling, you might say, because it was just a small town floating out there. Yeah. We had one. We called it a sail locker and had three sewing machines in it. One was a canvas machine and a parachute rigger machine, which is a little smaller. And then they had a, just a regular sewing machine, Singer sewing machine. <laughs> and it was, wasn't was in use, so I was down there quite often I was sewing flags because we had, oh. we had a bolt of each color that the uh, Navy used for flags. So I could just make any any uh, flag I wanted. And uh, flags would wear out. They were whipping in the wind and they would wear out. And sure. then we'd need another one. Especially the Fox flag we flew it for um, flight operations. And uh, at one time there was a, one of our sister ships sent out a message to all of us that they needed two fox flags because theirs were wore out. <laughs> so my uh, uh, superior volunteer <laughs> volunteered that I make, make them two fox flags, and, which I did. And then one of the pilots, as he took off, he went over that ship and dropped it on the flight deck. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> What was the name of your skipper? Uh, captain Stedman Teller was our first captain. Teller? Sted, Stedman Teller. Mm -hmm. And he was he was a very good captain. He was just so kind to everyone and and he he let us know when we did something wrong that he thought and, uh, we just we, we tried to work for him. Was he regular navy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was later a captain of one of the bigger ships, uh -huh. bigger uh, carriers. And did you have a second uh, skipper then? Yes. Later? 
and uh, he wasn't liked as well as the first one. But I got along good with him because mm -hmm. um, seems like I, I took messages up to him quite often and I'd stand there at attention while he read it and uh, wrote out a message to send back or something. So that was rather exciting for you, actually, to be able to get on board and go up to to, uh, to the bridge yes. and see some some of the activities going on. Yes, it was, and uh, uh, I felt fortunate that that I could be in the signal force, and because uh, uh, the others that. Uh, they had just had to work all the time. Yeah, yeah. And we we didn't have to work as hard. What were some of the ports that you docked at? Oh, uh, we we docked. Uh, of course, we got uh, docked at uh, not dock. We were an anchor at uh, Honolulu, and then uh, uh, we docked at uh, San Francisco. San Diego and Seattle and Bremerton. I see. <clears throat> Different times. And uh, when you were out for that 60 days, you had to have refueling, did you not? Yes. And when the, uh, our task force, we had two tankers, two fuel tankers, and one supply ship. And uh, if we needed some supplies, why a destroyer would pick them up and bring them to whatever ship needed them. And the tankers would uh, we refuel as we, as we went along. And, um, one time we were in the tail end of a typhoon, and they were um, they were filling our ship with with oil, hmm. and it was pretty rough because. Those guys had to handle those lines and those yeah. big hoses. I think they were about probably four or five inches in diameter that day. The fuel came across from yeah. the tanker to the ship. Were there many typhoons out there that you went through? One. One. Just one, yeah. What did they do with the planes on deck? Well, one time we lost three planes. Thirty? Three. Three. That uh, were washed overboard. Sure. They were all uh, anchored down, but even so, they were. It was force enough to uh, wash them overboard. Yeah. And we would take uh, uh, a wave over the flight deck that uh, we were pitching quite quite a bit and take a uh, wave over the flight deck and it would flash clear up on a bridge. So, it was rough. Yeah. How was the chow when you were at sea? It was pretty good. Was it? Uh, re you know, considering that we'd been out a long time, uh, of course we had, uh, our eggs or dried eggs or, sure. uh, and that's the way the potatoes were. And but you had a clean rack to lay in every night. Yes, I sure did. And uh, had a bakery aboard that baked the bread. And uh, uh, it was just it just amazing, really, what what they had aboard ship. Did you have any aircraft guns on board the steamer bay? Anti-aircraft guns to shoot down enemy planes on board. Yes, we had uh, 40, mil 40 millimeters in each corner, uh, two, two two tubs, and it was a 40 millimeter in each tub. And then in between, I think it was five 20 millimeters. And then on the other side it was the same. And then they had a five-inch gun. The fan tail, we call it the stern stinger. And, the uh, stern stinger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you were credited. The ship was credited with bringing down how many enemy planes? Well, 
can't remember, was it six? I think it was six or eight, yes. Yeah. And uh, when the war was winding down, they, they were trying to sell lawns aboard ship. Oh. And uh, if you'd have your picture taken, uh, like I did there, uh, let's see, if you bought a bond, then you got your picture taken, I guess that's the way And it you could send it back? And yeah, so I could send it to the That's office. where you were in that picture? Yes. And uh, our letters were censored. Oh. And uh -huh. my folks got a letter once that um, an officer had censored and he didn't care too much for me, I guess. They, the folks, all they got was your folks, and then I had to sign, and they cut out the rest of it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and after that, uh, this pilot friend that was lost over the side, he'd, he'd sign my, uh, my letters with his little signature, and then I'd take it down to the post office. I knew him down there, got acquainted with him, and he'd stamp it, and off it go. And they weren't looked at that much? No. There was two, two uh, personnel in the post office and we were acquainted with those, another guy and I. So when we got letters, they, they would let us volunteer to help sort them, because we had to sort them right quick because they were waiting. Sure. The crew was waiting. They were standing in line waiting for Sure. Their mail. Who did you get mails from? I got it from my girlfriend and my folks. Was that that Mary from? Uh, yes. From high school. Yes. And your folks wrote you. Your sisters, yes. right? Sisters, I don't remember if they did or not. They probably did. Did you save any of the letters? Um, yes, I did, but I don't know where they are. Yeah. My uh, sister was. She was an artist, I would say, because she could draw pretty good. And she uh, drew a picture of a, a naked woman with long hair that was covering herself and with the hair. And I pinned it up in my locker. <laughs> and you were very popular then? Well, probably, Among yeah. the crew? When I, when I opened that locker door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not unusual, was it? No. That's good. Did you receive any food or uh, packages from home? I got a package of cookies once and they were pretty well crushed and everything and it didn't take long until they were gone. Now did, they didn't have helicopters then, did they? No. So the packages had to be either brought by ship <coughs> or dropped by air? Well, they didn't. Packages, they didn't drop them by air, but they they transport them from sh ship to ship. Sure, of course, and you could get the mail because you were a carrier ship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you have a regular mail run, did they have? Uh, that I don't remember, but I don't believe so. Yeah. I don't think they did. And uh, aboard our ship, we could make ice cream. And every time a destroyer would come alongside to transport something, We'd give them a can of ice cream, so they were they were glad to come alongside. I bet they were, yes. Yeah, that ice cream tasted pretty good. Were there any humorous, uh, funny things that uh, happened while you were on board ship that you can remember? Well, I can't remember anything right off. How many times did you come back? to the States? Oh, uh, we, uh, for some reason, our ship uh, collected barnacles and there was a little, um, some kind of a sea urchin or something that when you go through the water and they brush against the ship, they just hang on. And those little barnacles you get enough of them and they slow you down. So 
our top speed, we couldn't keep up with the rest of the fleet. Mm. So they, one time they sent us into the dry docks at Pearl Harbor, and one time they sent us into dry docks in San Francisco. How long would it take you to get back from your duty station? About two weeks. Uh, to San Francisco, two weeks. Yes. And that, did you, was, that was travel time. Yes. And then it was another two, two weeks, weeks to get back. Scraping barnacles. Oh, you did the scraping. Well, the whole crew did. Did they? Yes, that was a job. We'd scrape. Dry dock? Yes. And we'd scrape and paint and scrape and paint. Mm -hmm. no, extra, no extra pay. No extra pay, no. Uh, we did get extra pay. Uh, we call it sea duty. At, at sea. As soon mm -hmm. as we left the yeah. state, so that we got. Well, that's fascinating. And the last, last time we were in San Francisco, we were uh, getting our ship scraped and so on and getting it ready to go back. And uh, the war was over, so. They just kept us there and they put on uh, a thousand bunks on the hangar deck. They were five high and they were welded so they were sturdy. And then we started hauling uh, troops back. Is that right? The Marines and soldiers. Hmm. And, uh, they didn't get a lot of good food, but they they didn't care. They were on their way home. They were on their way home. You remember, yeah. the, you remember any of the outfits that you carried particularly? No, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't. Where would you pick them up? Um, Okinawa or Saipan, uh, one of those little islands. Where were you when you heard about the uh, war ending? We were in San Francisco. Do you remember uh, hearing about the atomic bomb? And yes, what? we were we were out there at the time, and uh, we heard that some something huge had happened to Japan, and then a day or two later we got the details on it. Yeah, found out that it was an atomic bomb. And shortly thereafter, the armistice was. Signed, and you were in, still in dry docks. You were still in San Francisco. Yes. And, uh, Quite a celebration Well, in town. Yes, it was, but I don't remember celebrating any of this. I didn't, uh, I didn't like to drink, and no. that's what a lot of them did. Yeah. They just go ashore and, and see how drunk they could get. <laughs> did your family come to visit uh, when you came in? At no, all. no. Did you get any liberty to go back to see them? Yes, we got uh, uh, liberty to go back then and, and uh, see them a week. And then, so you went back by train? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I flew, flew to uh, Denver and then the train. You flew commercial? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was exciting. Was that the first time you were in the air? Um, I may have, but no, no, I think I had a ride one other time when I was younger, but... I was wondering if you had ever gotten a ride on any of the planes on on the carrier. Uh, I took off one time with a, a torpedo bomber as a gunner, because we weren't in, in two days in the water, so uh, I asked the uh, flight commander, who was right on the bridge with me there, um, and he says, why sure, there'd be one of those gunners that would be glad to have you go up in this place. So I got to go up in a, in a gun turret and uh, all doubled up for takeoff. And then after we took off, and then I was down with the radio man right below me. So uh, what, what kind of a plane was that? A that Douglas? A torpedo bomber. Uh, with two, two men, three, three, three men. men. My goodness. Yeah. 
it was one of the, the uh, it was Avenger. So you, oh, the Avenger, yes, all right. And so you were sitting high, facing backwards. Yes, <laughs> all doubled up. Yes. And went off that catapult, it was just... Was it exciting? Well, yes. It was, <laughs> they said to be sure and, and hold your your forehead real tight against your knees, and uh, which I did, and just bang! It was we were gone. We were off the ship. Looked back, and there was there was that little ship that was <laughs> sitting in the water. Amazing. And uh, what kind of a mission was it? It was just a four-hour reconnaissance, and they just see if they could find any submarines. Did you see anything of unusual? No, no, not that I can remember. And who was below you? Did you say the radio operator? Yeah, he was. He was uh, right, right below me, so I could. They have radar. Not a board plane that I can remember. No. No, it was a visual. Was he the navigator as well? Mm, well, he may be. <coughs> Maybe he did some navigating, but I think the pilot pretty much did it himself. Well, <clears throat> well that was exciting, wasn't it, for you? Well, I thought it was. I uh, Absolutely. Uh, the other thing to my name, couldn't figure out how and why in the world I'd want to take off like that, but I just thought it was something different. And, uh, the convoy was... Uh, not too far from Japan, and uh, they had two of us carriers and four destroyers uh, that broke away from the rest of the group. This was not after the war, this is during the war. This is during the war. Yeah. And uh, they sent us in uh, toward Tokyo, and uh, they said we were within 50 miles of Tokyo at the time, and uh, uh, and what happened? The uh, we went into this harbor and did whatever mission we were supposed to do, and we turned around to leave, and one of our engines quit. So we we were hobbling back to the to get out of the way. And uh, there was a Japanese plane that must have found out about us, and it was circling overhead for quite a while. And it finally gave up and left us alone, but we got out of there without being detected. The, uh, did we, you were alone then? Uh, they left us there alone, yeah. <laughs> the convoy went off. The convoy, they just... They didn't really leave us there, but they, they left us in that harbor, and uh, we had to live back to the uh, to our uh, convoy. And, uh, How many days did it take you to get back? I think it took all of one day. Oh. Yeah. We, uh, <clears throat> we were anchored off. This is right after the war, and uh, we noticed our, this barge was going out with three jeeps on the barge, and they would go out out of sight and come back empty. And I told the commander about it, which uh, he uh, looked into it and found out that we could uh, buy them for uh, they had three grades, $100, $75, and $50, and the $50, didn't, they didn't run. You could buy a, a Jeep? Yeah, buy a Jeep. A military Jeep? A military Jeep. Oh. So there was four of us that, that got permission to um, buy a Jeep, and I, I bought one of the $100 Jeeps. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, what are you going to do with a Jeep on board ship? 
Well, we just <coughs> just anchor it down and take it back to the states. And you could get away with that? Oh yes, because the commander was one of them. That <laughs> so he he didn't have any trouble getting permission. I won't ask you to name the commander, but uh, so so then what happened? We were anchored here, and then the was it the, where where were you anchored? Um, I'm not real sure now, but I think it was Okinawa or um, Iwo Jima, one of those. Okay. And uh, we got orders to go back to the States one day before we were supposed to get these jeeps. So <laughs> You were ordered we, uh, to go back? Go back to the States, uh, and then we had an empty flight deck and could have had as many jeeps as we wanted, I guess, but we didn't. And didn't have any. What were they doing with these jeeps? They were just getting rid of them. No one knows for sure, but they... Dumping just, them overboard? They were pushing them overboard, yeah. Off this barge. Sounds like a bunch of Marines <laughs> doing things that they do best. <laughs> so you lost a hundred bucks. No, I didn't. I got it back. Oh, you did get it back? Oh, yes. Yes, the commander. I think the commander had had our, had our money and oh, that's he funny. just gave it back to us. That's funny. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, then, uh, what kind of duty, um, you, uh, when the war was over, you were, of course, transporting troops back and forth, certainly back from the mm -hmm. combat zone. And how long, how long were you doing that? Through the rest of 45? We uh, we made uh, three trips, if I remember right, and that was that was the end of my time. So I got to leave. And How did you? Uh, was that because you had a certain number of points? Yes. Uh -huh. so I when did you leave the ship, sir? Uh, must have been in March because uh, I went from there to. Uh, Norman, Oklahoma. March 45. March 45. Or 46. 46. 46, 46, 46 that's yes. right. And uh, we went to Oklahoma and got our discharge and then... Well, that's where you left, uh, you got your discharge. Yeah, they turned us loose and we hitchhiked home. So I was... Uh, and did you let your folks know you were coming? Yes. Uh -huh. And, uh, Tell me about the reunion when you got home. Well, I don't remember much about that, but I suppose they were all excited that I was home, the war was over. And, yes. And I was safe at home. Yes. Where did you do then? Did you take a little time off? Well, I... Um, I got a quarter of land, and uh, I was trying to be a farmer. Well, I didn't get enough land. My my dad then sold me one of his quarters and rented me another one. Mm. Uh, so I had that. I had three quarters, but it wasn't enough, and I couldn't get any more land. So I just. That was after we'd been there about a year, mm -hmm. or maybe more than that. Yeah, it was more than a year, I'm sure, but uh, I had milk cows, and they weren't making any money. They were buying their groceries, but... And you were, uh, and I had you were by your, living by yourself then? Well, I built a basement house. My, my wife uh, oh, had work in, in Oberlin. She worked as a nurse. Where, now, where, where did you pick up this wife along the way? Well, um, my sister introduced us when I was home on leave. What, what was this girl's name? Faith Lonquist. Faith? Faith, F-A-I-T-H. Lonquist? Lonquist, yes. Okay. And she was, don't she tell was, me, Swedish? She, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, she had uh, uh, gone to nurses' training in Chicago, 
oh. at uh, Presbyterian, and she was home on leave. And so she was in the navy. She was uh, a navy a nurse? cadet. Oh, I see. She was a cadet. Then, as soon as the, navy, the war was over, she. Where did you meet? She, we met in church. Um, her dad was our pastor. Oh. At that church at the time, and, and she came home to. Uh, what was his name? The the church. The pastor. Was, pastor was uh, Reverend Lonquist. Her first, dad. First name. Uh, J. O. Lonquist. Okay. And the church name was. Uh, Swedish Covenant Church. In Oberlin. In out on a farm, out in the country. Out in the country. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, All right, and uh, you said you met her in church. My sister uh, introduced me. At a social gathering? At just one of the, I think the evening, evening service. We had evening services in morning and evening. Uh huh. And uh, did things seem to uh, connect right away? Yes. Uh, Pretty much right away. It didn't take much thinking. I, I had broken off with the child, my uh, high school sweetheart uh -huh. at the time, and so. Uh, and she was available. Yes, she was available. And, How would you, you know, describe her? Beautiful. <laughs> uh, she was a little little shorter than me, and then um, by. Um, Maybe dirty blonde hair, and uh, she wore glasses because she had one lazy eye. But she was, she was, she was my beauty. How oh, nice! We were married for just about sixty-five years. How many? Sixty-five. My goodness! What year were you married? We married in forty-seven. Nineteen forty-seven, and the date? Um, I should remember that. 17th of August. Okay. It was hot. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> Our church didn't have any air conditioning. <clears throat> you married at church? Yes. And who officiated? My, uh, my father-in-law and uh, his, uh, his brother-in-law and uh, I guess that was it. And, the uh, church had no air conditioning, and the candles bent over. Oh golly! And went out. <laughs> well, it was it was quite a time, but I know how that heat can in the Midwest. Yes. In August can uh, devastate you sometimes. Yes. And where did you go on a honeymoon? We uh, went to her folks had a a little cabin and. Wisconsin, close to Ashland, and we went up there and spent our honeymoon. Spent there a week or so. Oh. And was she working? Was well, she was a cadet? You said. Yes. At Presbyterian it, Hospital in Chicago. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, she quit her job in Chicago when we got married, and uh, got a job in in Oberlin as a, a nurse and uh, we dated. So she was a registered nurse? Yes. By that time? Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, we started dating and she just swept me off my feet. Oh my, <laughs> so, but she was pretty happy too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's neat. Uh, so after you were married then what did you, where did you live? We made a uh, we lived in town for six months, and I drove to the country and uh, made a basement house and uh, set it up with blocks. On your tar on the property you owned? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived in that basement house then for about five years. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, then uh, one time my wife... Uh, uh, went to visit her folks. They were then at the time were 
pastor in uh, New Gotland, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And she got uh, um, a kidney disease. So she had one kidney removed after when she was pregnant with her youngest daughter. Really? My goodness. So, Where did she have that surgery then? That was in Halstead, Kansas. My goodness. And uh, the uh, doctor that um, operated on her, she knew from Chicago, so he was pretty pleased it was someone she knew. Yes, I bet she was. So that was quite uh, dangerous. Yes, it was. Because it was just touch and go for about a week or so. Uh -huh. And uh, then did her uh, pregnancy terminate with a yes. birth? Oh, yes. And who, who arrived? Uh, June. And she's, she's their youngest, of course. And June is your youngest or oldest? It's the youngest, because we had two, two children. Oh, so this was a second. Oh, all right, when did your first child came, come? Um, our first daughter was born in 1948, and the son was born in 1950. The daughter's name, first daughter? Was Susan Anderson. Susan Anderson, yes. Okay. And she lives where? In Colorado Springs. Oh, not too far. No. And she's, and she's married? And what's her married name? She was married, yes, to okay. Highfield. Okay. They had three children. So. All right. And the three children are your grandchildren? Yes. How many grandchildren do you have? Eight. Eight. All yes. right. And what are these grandchildren doing? Just. Um, well, her three. The one is going, the youngest one is going to veterinary school in California, and the middle one is a teacher in Colorado Springs, and the, the boy is, uh, um, I don't know what you'd call his occupation, but he's, he has to do with uh, raising fish. Oh. Tilapia. Oh, yes. So uh, uh, he's developed a lot of of ideas and and things with the fish tanks there and, um, when he went to school in Arizona. Very good. And your second child was a boy, did you say? Yes, he's a born boy. Born when? Born in 1950. And his name? Uh, Eric. Eric. Uh, um, <laughs> Where is Eric now? Eric right now is uh, in Arizona. He just uh, graduated from college there and, and uh, he's pursuing his uh, um, fish tanks and his uh, growth with uh, um, vegetables without soil. Oh. With uh, just uh, waste. From did, did he marry? Uh, no, no, he's not married. He hadn't married. And then your youngest one is June. June. And she was born in? 1952. Mm -hmm. Out in Oberlin? Yes. Uh -huh. And June is married? Yes, she was. And, uh, and had children, three children, you say? Three children, yeah. yes. And, uh, uh, they come to see me quite often. How nice. Uh, so one of the grandkids last night, or yesterday. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and now my another grandchild is going to visit here another day or two. How nice. So What are their names? Uh, Lisa. Lisa Todd is... Uh, is June's uh, girl, and then her boy is uh, Andrew, Andy Todd. Okay. But just just two two kids there. I'm sorry okay. Uh huh. And, uh, and my oldest daughter has three, and then my son has three. So. But your the son's name? Uh, Mark. I mean the t the children of the sons. Uh. Eric and um, Kirsten and and uh, oh, 
You know, I can't think of the one that's going to veterinary school. Oh, I'm sorry. When you have eight of them, that's kind of hard to remember, isn't it? Well, yeah, you know, when your memory isn't any better than mine. Well, I have ten of them, and I often that wondered why I haven't just named them numbers. <laughs> yes. Number three, number seven, <laughs> number eight, and whatever. Sometimes it's easier. Yes. Well, uh, then did you continue doing uh, farming? Uh, for about five years and then couldn't get any, enough land so uh, I sold out. I did have sheep too at the time with the milk cows and uh, sold out and moved to Denver and didn't have a job or anything but uh, this guy at church knew uh, the, the foreman at uh, International Harvester and he got me on down there and I worked my way up. From, in Denver? In Denver, yes. Where did you live here then? Uh, in Denver. Yes, sir. We lived uh, uh, in uh, North Denver for about uh, a month and then my uh, brother-in-law already lived in Denver, so he knew of a house that was, was uh, under GI loan, 4% GI loan, that she was about to lose it, so we bought it from her for Good. $500. Excellent, yes. And that's where we started. And, How long did you live there? Uh, about uh, 20 some years. Uh, so the children all went to school in in Aurora. In Aurora, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, dug a basement out, basement underneath that house. And, and what did you? What kind of work were you doing at International Harvester? Uh, mechanic. Working uh, on what? Uh, I worked at uh, International Harvester for about ten years, and then. Uh, I uh, went to the grocery chain that was close by. I don't know, I just wanted to change, I guess, and um, went to work down there, and I was their only mechanic for several years. Is that right? Working on their trucks? On their trucks. My goodness. Yeah, and my boss at the time was very nice. He, uh, uh, get me jobs on the outside that for the bosses up in the office. <laughs> I'll bet there were times uh, working over there too that you wished you had a US Jeep. Yes, yeah, <laughs> it would have been it would have been a lot of fun. It would have been a lot of fun. I used to like to go hunting and, uh -huh. and uh, what did you hunt? Hunted for deer. Where? Uh, Here in, in the mountains, yeah. Nearby? Yes. Uh -huh. uh, what kind of a gun did you shoot? I had a, a 30 out 6. Mm -hmm. I got it a surplus and uh, made a new stock for it. And, and uh, I uh, had a chance to get a 7, seven millimeter mag and I bought that gun and that was my favorite then. And for uh, Bigger animals? Well, for honey elk. And, yes, at one time. Did you shoot elk? Yes. And where was that? That was up by Steamboat. Okay. Um, well, we got acquainted with a, a rancher over there that would take you into the wilderness. And uh, he put up a tent, and my brother in law and I stayed in that tent for a week and hunted. And I got got my cow elk because I had a cow license. Uh -huh. And uh, got it all, all cut it out and skinned and brought it back. Were there a lot of stories around the campfire? Oh, yes, it was. We had a good time. <laughs> Did you good? Yeah. He had a a sheep herder stove inside the tent and uh -huh. it was cold. Sure. Snow on the ground. 
uh, we just had a good time. What uh, kind of hobby did you have at that time when you were living um, in Denver, in Aurora? I liked to work with wood, and uh, and about 1990, I uh, uh, went to a carving class with a friend that uh, thought I would enjoy it, and I did. And I got started carving, and then later on we got started carving birds. And, really? And that's what I loved to do was I made. 35 birds that I've given to the grand, grandchildren. And, Have you really? And you, you didn't bring one down, did you, for us to take a look at? No, I did not. Whoop. I didn't even have a picture with me. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so that's your form of art, and that's your form of hobby. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you made any for the uh, village here? No. Not yet? Not yet. <laughs> okay. Uh, what kind of recreation did you and your wife and the family do um, uh, when you were living here? When I retired, my boss at the time gave me a little wagon camper. And uh, we used that, that camper and it was... It was a newer, newer camper, so it had uh, a water-cooled engine. Wow! And so we put 180,000 miles on that driving all over the United States. Did you? Where did you go? And what did you like best? Well, we went to the West Coast a couple times, and went to uh, uh, Washington State to visit my cousin and. Uh, Different people out in sure. Seattle area. Did you go back east? Went back to Maine to visit my sister. Uh, and we drove up through Canada when we went to Maine one time. And uh, that was really a, a beautiful trip. A beautiful trip. What a great idea. And uh, we stayed out there for a while and then. This is my sister. She went back. Now the children left, and uh, and you folks decided that uh, you needed to retire in some place. How did you get the Covenant Village here? Uh, let's see. It was 1967 when I retired. 67? 67, yes. Okay. And how long have you been living here in Covenant Village? Uh, we've been here over nine years. Nine years? Yes. So you moved in here approximately 2002? 2002, yes. Or three. Mm -hmm. And we, we moved here from uh, we lived at, uh, uh, right off of I-25 and Ivanhoe. Well, right off of 25 and Yale. And uh, our address was Ivanhoe. And when you moved in here, uh, what? how did you find this place? Uh, the Covenant Village? Yes. Had you uh, heard about it? Oh, yes. My uh, good friend... Eva Nelson was uh, part of the committee that found this land, oh. and uh, we were with him at the time that he showed us oh, the land that they were proposing to buy, and later on they, they did buy it mm -hmm. and started the tower. And you moved where? Into the tower? We moved into the second floor of the tower. Mm -hmm. And how long were you there? Uh, up until last December, and my wife got uh, got sick and was over here at uh, uh, rehab. And On campus here at yes. the health center. And I was put into uh, 
an apartment so I could be near her. Oh, over there? Over here, yes. Oh, nice, and, uh, yes. And then uh, later we found the, found this place where we, where we are right now. Uh-huh. So, uh, and, and you you have family visiting you every now and then? Yes, here and there. yes, sir. And you're happy here? Oh, yes. What makes this place so special for you? Well, it's the people. People are just wonderful. And the staff, they're just wonderful. Uh, That's great. Uh, let me ask you uh, this. What advice would you give young men and women uh, growing up today uh, in our country as, it, as you see it today? What should they be thinking about? What should they be doing? What should they know to make life an easier and a better place? And what are some of the pitfalls that they have to be careful of? Um, Can you give me any ideas along those lines? No, there's uh, uh, the way I feel. Our country is is uh, not as wonderful as it was 50 years ago, and it just uh, it just can't tell what what it is for sure, but um, if we can just hang on to our our Christian foundation that this country was founded on and uh, hang on to what threats we do have and, yeah. um, to keep it a Christian country. Yeah. It has been a change since the uh, 40s during the war, when everybody was together, everybody everyone just united. We're just everyone just got together in in the war effort. And the ones that that weren't living near uh, defense factories and so on, they did their job by collecting uh, papers and right. and uh, metal and for the war effort. Well, Signalman Anderson, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your service to our country. And uh, I want to thank you for coming and being with us here this afternoon or this morning and sharing your experiences with us. We appreciate it and uh, wish you well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Hold on just a minute and I'll let this... Go on.